Uh, my name is Peter Silverstone. I'm a professor at University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada. And I've been involved in doing some research looking at how to help the police interact better with those who have uh, mental, Ill, mental health issues or addiction issues. And we've set up a training program that's done very well and we're planning to expand that to other first responders. It can be very hard for a first responder to provide care for somebody who's in a mental health crisis. Uh, but that is often the case. First responders are the ones on the scene. And there's two issues to this. One is the fact that how, what skills do they need to help them better manage the situation, de-escalate the situation, and provide an empathic interaction. Second, there's something called vicarious uh, trauma, uh, particularly uh, what's often called in the army occupational stress injury, which can really lead to a lot of problems for individuals. And I, as a psychiatrist, a practicing clinician, have seen many individuals who have had this, whether this is nursing or people in EMR or police, uh, really seeing unpleasant things is difficult. And now I think we're beginning to realize that the vicarious trauma can be even further. People such as me who view or hear very traumatic things can themselves be affected. Uh, it's one of the things about humans, we're not able to dissociate ourselves and it's very hard for first responders. So in, there are two parts to this. One is how do you train first responders and by this EMS, police, nurses, ambulance, etc., fire, uh, to interact better with those mental illness and secondly what can you do to increase their resiliency so that when they do interact things go better for them. So there are two sides, and first of all I'm going to talk about what to do when you approach a situation as an emergency responder. And currently we're working with a number of police organizations, but we expect to expand this, about a series of training programs. And there are a number of key elements you want to deal with. One is empathic communication. So what's the very first thing you do? Well, body language is important when you come up, and it's really important, it might sound simple, always introduce yourself by your first name. Hi, I'm Peter. And if you notice, I leaned forward, I looked at you. Whereas if I'm looking at you and I'm talking to you, but I'm actually surveying the scene all the time, your view of me will be different. So the first is introduce yourself. The second is really focus on the individual. Try and use a warm body language, an open body stance, and open questions. So rather than, for example, if you're EMS arriving at something, don't ask a closed question, you'd ask an open one, such as, what did you see or what did you experience? Another tip is to try and use things that allow you to demonstrate empathy. I understand it must be very difficult for you. It must be hard for you. It must be stressful for you. I'm sorry you experienced that. If somebody's had some difficulty, I'm sorry that you experienced that. You're not apologizing and say you did something wrong, but you're demonstrating empathy. These are really realistic tips that do make a difference to the way people perceive you. So it's uh, enhancing empathy, it's enhancing communication skills, often using nonverbal techniques, and it's the ability to de-escalate a situation. As a first responder, you are dealing with people at an acutely stressful situation. So they are emotionally aroused. People who have an underlying mental illness often are more emotionally aroused, but not necessarily. You can get people very, very angry and very, very upset, and you need to be able to deal with that. You also need to deflect the insults when people insult you. Often that is because they're stressed. Sometimes it's because they're intoxicated. But in any event, you don't want to react to that. You've got to also develop techniques of how do you deflect these kind of situations. And so there, there is some training. Uh, I'm involved in some active training with this uh, to try and help first responders do this. And I think there's a series of training ways and approaches that work. There's an internet online training program. There is in-person training programs. And there are more uh, comprehensive training programs. The in-person ones seem to work better when you have role play, you have actors and so on doing this to take you through in a realistic way. So those are all different ways in which you as a first responder can learn to cope better. The second part that you really need to be aware of, and I don't think we do this well but I believe it's improving, is you need to have your own resiliency enhanced. So if I'm going to see a lot of trauma and unfortunately that's the nature of, of the work that you do as police, fire, ambulance, nurse and so on. 
how do you deal with it? How do you process that? How do you manage to not affect it? And it's interesting when you speak to people who've been in this for a short time or a longer time, everybody has their own skills. But simply thinking, oh, I'll just get on with it, is not a good coping mechanism. Repressing it doesn't usually work. It might for the short term, but it really doesn't in the long term. And I think we're very much aware of occupational stress injury, uh, post-traumatic stress, sometimes post-traumatic stress disorder, being a very real outcome of continuous exposure to trauma, even if you're not the one physically threatened. By witnessing it, arriving at horrific scenes, you know, seeing very distressing things, how do you process it? It's very important to know. And then there are some tools being developed, uh, particularly by the Department of National Defense, uh, but also now used more widely in police and EMS, that do allow you to start having some tools to help. Ultimately, it's a cultural phenomenon. Unless your organization recognizes this is important, it's prepared to put the time to allow you to have the time before you work, while you work, after you work, as yes, this is key, it isn't going to change. And I wish I could say organizations uh, in this country were as proactive as they need to be. That process is changing, but we need to do more work there.